Reconciliation. What does this mean to you? This is the Journey with Care podcast, where we navigate honest conversations about faith, culture, and loving our neighbors. I am the host, Melvina Gabosh, and I am an Indigenous lover of Jesus. Welcome to Journey with Care with Melvina Gabosh, where we are journeying with care. Um, Today, we have Melissa Spence with us in studio. We have Melissa Spence with us. She is a pastor's wife from Blessings Church. She has her own ministry that she has been working on and developing with God. She has a heart for women, a heart for women to rise up, to preach and to speak and to, you know, share their stories. She's given many women the opportunity and the stage to speak their truth and to be everything that God has called them to be. Uh, Me and Melissa have hosted a women's conference together. So I've known her for a while. She's been such an encouragement in my life, a godly woman in my life, someone that I look up to and someone that has mentored me in different areas of my walk and of my life with the Lord. So I'm excited to have her in the studio with us today. Hello, Melissa. Hello, Melvina. (laughs) Well, I'm glad that you're able to join us today. Yes, I'm honored to have. I'm exactly a little nervous today, but you know, I just have some exciting things to share about what the Lord's been doing in my life and just tell my story. I don't really tell it very often, maybe in my church, but there's just a select few that actually come regularly to hear it. You have a powerful story, a powerful testimony of what God has done in your life. And I wanted to invite you around the table and just to be able to share that and to share your voice with the rest of the world and, and our listeners, our podcast listeners. I feel that your voice is very powerful and God is using it in a mighty way. So thank you for coming and joining us. So tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll go into a little bit about ministry. Okay. Well, I come from Poplar River First Nation, which is on the east side of Lake Winnipeg, and it's a remote community fly-in. We have a winter road, so I grew up there. Um, pretty sheltered, coming out to the city once in a while and traveling in the summer to various camp meetings with my family. So I grew up in a primarily Christian home up until uh, about my mid-teens uh, when my uh, my family fell apart. In my teen years, I moved to Winnipeg to you know pursue my education and been pretty much at home in Winnipeg. So my upbringing was Christian-based, but there was a lot of religion and a lot of patriarchal views, and I kind of suffered through that. And it it took me, what, 27 years with the Lord, um, just trying to navigate who I am, what does the Lord want me to do? He gave me a vision way back when I was a, a young girl, and I'm thinking, how is that? And I translated into this patriarchal view that I'm only to be a helper Mm -hmm. (laughs) and not really necessarily a leader. And my voice didn't matter is what I was kind of in that environment that my voice didn't matter and I was lower than than a man. So I spent a lot of time working behind the scenes and not recognizing that the Lord, um, you know, the Lord just did a work in me in the last few years. And just took me around. And it's interesting that I I have a professional background and I worked in the corporate world for about 12 years um, prior to 2019. And my two worlds didn't match up. Um, I kind of felt like I was this one way in the corporate world. I was a manager, kind of worked my way up and had a voice. People respected that voice. But on the other side, in the church world, I didn't have a voice, mm-hmm. and it didn't really matter. And I just, it just felt that way, and it was kind of reinforced, really, because uh, although I've been pastoring with my husband, co-pastoring uh, Blessings Church, and since was it two thousand eight in November, so in November it'll be fourteen years. It, it was just this culture that you know the men would call the men up, and it was just this culture of. Just not recognizing that the vast majority of women in are in the churches. There's a majority of women mm-hmm. and very small percentage of men. But yet there's a, a big amount of men that are in leadership and not the women. And 
So I was that kind of woman that was just sitting in the corner getting frustrated because <laughs> I'm, I'm a leader in, you know, in the secular and in the corporate world, but I wasn't a leader. And I felt like I, I was like pretty much a mouse in the corner or a wallflower, you would call it. Nothing more than a helper. Nothing more than mm-hmm. a helper. So, you know, it, it got to the point where I got so frustrated and I said, is this, is this what it's supposed to be? I, I think, I think there's a big disconnect here. And, you know, we were brought up with the religious teachings and just that bondage of religion to say that, well, you have to just take your lot in life because of what Eve did. Mm -hmm. But when I read the Word of God, I'm thinking, well, Jesus died for all of us, and he set us free when the veil was rent, when he died on that cross. So we have complete access to uh, our Heavenly Father. And it just didn't make sense why women were kind of relegated to just being helpers and, you know, to be silent in the church. And and I just thought, okay, so Jesus didn't set us free then. If that's what religion taught us, you're not really free You're because you're a woman. So I studied, and but then it's reinforced. So after I went through a really tough time in the last four or five years, and I've told my story, but I'm not going to kind of go into that right now. But but it it just made me come to this point where, okay, I'm not two people anymore. It's got to be. I'm this way in the corporate world, and it's got to match up with what yes. is happening in the church. So I started getting my voice back, and it was tough. It, w- it meant changes in my marriage. It meant changes with uh, my relationships with my children, with my extended family, my immediate family. But it, it's about just putting boundaries and really asserting that I am a, a woman, yes, but I am a child of God. Yes. When we get to heaven, there is no sex. There's no male and female. It's just that on earth we we have. But I kind of had to fight through that. And now, now I'm just at this place where the Lord, I know the Lord's calling me to something greater. And it mind boggles me where the Lord wants to take me. And my reaction to him is just like Moses. Why me? Like, <laughs> why me, Lord? <laughs> yeah, why me, Lord? I, I really don't know how to speak. I've been kind of in the shadows. So how is this going to work? And how how is this going to happen? So it's just this understanding of that, yes, I'm a co-pastoring this church, but I have a calling that's um, a calling that I didn't quite understand before. And, and that's the reason why I've been so frustrated with how things have been going and how things played out in my life. And just in the last couple of weeks, I, I said, okay, Lord, okay, now I know what you're doing. Because he, he brought back the story of Moses. And I really liked that story because he tried to make changes and set his people free. But, you know, he tried to do it on his own first. And then the Lord had to take him into a wilderness. And I felt that's where I've been. I've been in the wilderness for a number of years. And just the Lord, you know, talking to me and teaching me and, and all this. And then there's this, this point where he commissions Moses at the burning bush, that whole experience and this whole conversation. So. I just feel that although Moses didn't quite understand, well, how am I going to free all these all these millions of people out of slavery and you know, send somebody else? And, um, you know, that fear and I'm like, well, how is this going to happen? Because our mind just can't fathom it. So I feel that's where I'm at today. So I'm also a mother of five children, and I just became a grandmother a few weeks ago. Congratulations. Thank you. And so, yeah, so that's a little bit about my journey and where I'm kind of at. <laughs> what does reconciliation mean to you? Well, and I, I kind of thought about that for quite a bit because it, it's actually the Lord God, our Father, who actually started the reconciliation process and when he sent his son to die for us. So in my mindset before, I used to think that the Lord 
uh, sent his son so that he, he could love us again, but that's not the case. That he actually sent his son because he loved us, not to make him love us. And so there's a lot of, a lo- in religion, it, it teaches you that, that we have to work for his love. And that's, it just comes out in that story of the prodigal son. Like we call it the prodigal son, but I think I'd rather call it the sons, the elder and the prodigal. And so I was kind of like that elder son um, who had everything that the father had. He was living in his household, and uh, he was the oldest son, and he had um, double portion of the inheritance, but he didn't see that. And uh, so he was working, and why, why you know, you, you see this whole conversation with the elder son and the, and the father when they're talking about the prodigal son, like you didn't kill the fatted calf for me. And, he, and the Lord said, everything that I have is yours. Yes. And he could have just killed the calf whenever he wanted. <laughs> yeah. And so recon- reconciliation, I think, is just understanding that Jesus died on the cross for us. Rose was buried and rose again so that we could that he could reveal the Father to us. And I think that's where we're kind of at. I think we kind of got into so much religion and I was caught in that for many, many years and I tried to pop my head out of, you know, that religion kind of world and then my, you know, was put right back in because I just didn't understand why Jesus came. And yes, it, it was all out of love. So reconciliation to me is reconciling to God the Father and learning to have that image, to to take on His image in how we re- live our lives and see ourselves. So it's all about a, the identity in Him and what Jesus done for us. So Jesus is a prime example of what we on her, here on earth should be where his kingdom is. The kingdom is, is us, and we need to be reconciled to him so that God could be glorified. That he can earth. be glorified. Yeah. Yes. It is by our love for each other that we will know that we are his disciples, Jesus said. Mm-hmm. Yes. And our unity is the method and message of our care. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> And I just love that. And it's when we're in that wilderness, the Lord takes us through this process of just dealing with the issues that have really hindered our relationship with Him. And and that's my story is that I didn't trust Him as a father. I didn't know who He was. And the reason for it is because of my background. My dad abandoned our family and created a whole new family, and he he dictated how much of a relationship he wanted and when. And and a lot of that, it was because he was an elder son as well. And it, it took me a long time to reconcile with my dad. And and it was upon this, when he died, and through that process of taking care of him and honoring him as my father, and understanding that he had the same issue I had, and it, it really had an impact on me when he passed away three years ago. And it's just to show this process of just working through that. And then there was that barrier of not trusting, and because I didn't trust my own dad, that I had this trust issue with God, God the Father. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, you know, in society today, there's this, this word that's been thrown around, reconciliation. And sadly, it's just been thrown around everywhere, right? So I, I feel that there is two different ways to look at it. It's reconciliation in a secular world mm-hmm. and then reconciliation back to Christ, right? So what are the two differences for you and how can we bring those two together? Well, first of all, is we actually, in order to have true reconciliation, we actually need to know and have a relationship with God the Father. And to be reconciled with him, it's not him that left. It's us through our sin. Yes. And and once you start having a relationship with God the Father and you start having this identity in him and I am my son or daughter, then, you know, through this relationship, this process of developing a relationship that's full of intimacy, you know, speaking to him, walking with him in daily life, 
then he transforms you into his image. And so so you you start to see other people the way he sees them. So in the secular, you, you have to earn respect. Yes. But in true reconciliation, you honor one another. Yes. And and respect is part of that. And so you build together. You build together, you walk along each side, and if somebody falls down, you lift them up. And so that that's what I think is happening. And right now there's such a, um, racism, and it's been ingrained because of the history of our of our nation, right? So our people have been so marginalized, so made to feel little. I think we have to have a reformation in our in the way our churches are. Uh, and I'm not talking just the building. I'm talking about the reformation of each of us individually, that we be reconciled truly uh, and not be afraid to just jump in daddy's lap and allow him to heal you in every way and make you whole so that you could actually walk in fullness and with peace and joy mm-hmm. in the Holy Ghost and have that relationship and walk alongside with him and co-laboring with him. Yeah, it's being reconciled back to Christ. But what what do we get when we when we're reconciled to Him? We get joy. We get peace. Mm-hmm. We get we get love. We get healing. We find our identity. Yeah, you know, I think that's where I found my my true reconciliation when I was reconciled back to Him. Mm-hmm. And then being reconciled back to Him, I was able to reconcile with others mm-hmm. because I found that peace and I found that love and I found that healing. Without that, I feel like that's where we're missing out. That's mm-hmm. where we're missing the mark, you know, because if, if we can't be reconciled back to Christ in his wholeness and and given all those things that he died for, he mm-hmm. died for us. He died that we would we would be whole. He would he died that we would have peace. He died mm-hmm. that we would we would know who we are, that we were sons and daughters of God. That's why he came and shed his blood, that we would be reconciled back to our identity, back to him. Mm-hmm. And without that peace, how can we be reconciled to one another? How can we love each other? How can we respect each other? How can we honor each other if we can't even honor ourselves? Exactly. And it says all in words, it's it talking, it talks about like love your neighbor as yourself. So we are even greater. Are greater. Are even greater. greater. Yeah. And so, but it's it's part of loving yourself and accepting that the Lord made you the way you are. And yes, there's some issues. Because we're all brought up in environments that are not perfect with parents that have tried their best, but, you know, missed the mark in some areas, while others areas they did really well. And I I really thank the Lord for my parents in those early years because they instilled in me to have a relationship with God. And when we're in church, that we're inside, we weren't outside playing with all the other children. And that even as children, that we are to serve the Lord. Yeah. So you grew up in a in a primary Christian home mm-hmm. most of your life, or all of your life, uh, right up until my mid teens, and then my my parents uh, separated, and my dad went off to create an, another family, and 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 through that through the abandonment, I I blame the Lord, <laughs> and and that was because I I just had this this religious mindset. And that was taught that, you know, we don't have any power and authority, that we are to beg for it, that we're, uh, that the Lord is this big, powerful God that if you do anything wrong, He straps you and, and pulls away from you until you smarten up. <laughs> but I realize now that the Lord is loves me, and, and no amount of whatever I did is not going to take His love from me. His love is so unconditional. It is. It's so unconditional. And I was talking to another uh, woman uh, the other day, and we were having a conversation. She had a similar story to mine. And being an elder son, you kind of think that you have to work for love. Mm -hmm. So we're both workaholics. And, well, I'm no longer a workaholic. I'm learning to rest in him. And to co-labor with him means that, He's the one that guides me. He's he's ahead of me and he's taking me along this journey. And when I'm in intimate relationship with him, he has this um it's just just a dynamic of that he has the authority, but he's given us that 
as well, right? That power. I kind of digress there. What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> We went on a little rabbit trail. I know. It's fine. I it's okay. love rabbit trails. Yeah, I love those kind of conversations too when we're, we're able to just, you know, just talk about, about everything else. Um, here at Care Impact, and I think the, the heart of Journey with Care is to connect and equip the whole church to effectively journey in community with children and families in hard places. From your experience, what would it look like for the church to journey with care with others? Well, I really believe that we all have to be reconciled with with God through the work of the cross, through the work of Jesus. Like He was sent to die for us, to be buried, and then to be resurrected, and He sent the Holy Spirit. So if we could just get to that point, and it's for everybody, it's for children, it's for parents, and it's for, you know, elders, it's for everybody. And you could start from wherever you're at. Once you get to that point is once you understand that he he has unconditional love for you and that we could trust him to lead us and that he has so much for us that he wants us to live abundantly, but he also wants us to bear fruit. Yes. So we have to be fruitful. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, so I had to kind of do go through this assessment of, okay, Am I living the gospel the way Jesus wanted us to live it? And I started thinking, okay, do do I pray for people and are they healed? Are they delivered? Do I walk with signs and wonders? And I like my mouth dropped and I'm, you know, and it just humbled me. And um, I said, well, how do you get that? Well, it's all about relationship with God. And that to be truly intimate with him is that you talk to him, you, you spend time with him, and he talks to you, and you listen to him, and he'll teach you and talk to you in many different ways. And once you get to know his voice, then that's all that matters because then I'm not striving anymore. It's him leading me. Yes. Yeah. Your trust is in him. And my trust is in him, and my identity is in him. So. N- I just go back to the story of when I was turning 40 and my husband announced a few weeks before, I want to give you a party. I'm like, no, I was screaming. You know, I literally got so angry with him for even suggesting to have a birthday party for me. And it was through talking to him later and he was saying, why are you so upset? And and, And it all came down to this. I was so afraid of being rejected. Like, if he invites somebody and they don't come. And he said, whoever is meant to be there will be there. And uh, you don't worry about the rest. So it's about trying to have that identity in him. It just gives you so much freedom because what really matters is what he thinks about me. And I know he loves me. He adores me. Yes. He, his face shines upon me. He gives me favor. Like, that's all that matters. And, and yes, people are going to be cruel. Why? Because they don't have that same relationship. And they just need to have that process, um, to go through that process, to become in his image and the same thing. Um, you know, have that relationship with him so that they're not having these insecurities in their life. What are some pieces of hope you can share with our listeners that reconciliation is happening? Well, I see that there's this transformation happening. I think we're starting to tear up and kind of recognizing religion when we see it. Uh, The celebritism, the focus on making names for ourselves, and that that's being torn down because it's not working anymore. Yeah, it's not working. No, it's not working. We have to come to that place where the Lord will get us to that place where we have the same kind of love that he has for our people. And now we can look at a person and love them so much and that the Lord will say, go and do this and say this or or do this thing and then pray with them and you say this or you could be in the service and you have this discernment and then you, you just go and pick up somebody from the crowd, bring them to the altar. And then you find out later that they were being a little scared to go up. And so that's that fear of, Intimacy, I think we as a church 
And I think it all comes down to th- that it is happening. People are, there is a remnant of people that are just so hungry for the Lord that we understand and coming to the knowledge that what we've been trying to do isn't working anymore. And the whole focus, our focus should be on relationship with God and let Him guide us and prepare us so that he, we're more than worthy to go and do His work. That, But we have to be sent. Yes. There are so many people that are just out there just sending themselves. And then you see it all over Facebook. You you see it in conversations. Oh, I'm out the I'm going to this place, but I need money. <laughs> you know, if you are in a relationship with God and he sends you, he will bring the provision and he will have... provide for you. Yes. What's his vision? He'll he'll provide he'll provide for it, right? So I guess our conversation is taking this kind of like reconciliation kind of tone to it. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the question that I do have is, do you see reconciliation amongst the churches? Like, so say there's a big population of indigenous churches Mm -hmm. in Manitoba, in Saskatchewan, in Alberta. There's a big population of indigenous churches. I I don't know um, about the relationship with the main, I guess, Um, The bigger churches, Mm -hmm. the capital C church, the white churches, I guess you would say. Where do you feel that reconciliation is missing? Um, How can we bring reconciliation to the body of Christ within the church Mm -hmm. in the context of non-Indigenous and Indigenous? Okay, well, I think we've kind of been segregated. And I remember going to a well-known church uh, way back in probably in the early 2000s, going to this huge church and walking in the doors and a a person coming up to me and my family, my husband and my children and saying, you know, greeting us, but then saying, you know, there's uh, Aboriginal churches elsewhere. Hmm. And I was a a bit offended and I said, well, isn't this the church of God? Maybe hurt. And yeah, I was, like yeah. Hurt. I think offense offense comes from a, a place of hurt, a mm-hmm. place of rejection, right? Yeah. So, and I'm thinking, no, we came to this church, and so we went sat down. But I've also attended our affiliate conference, annual conference that they had a few years ago, and they they did this presentation, and we we're one of the recognized Aboriginal churches under this affiliate body, and. They wanted to have a meeting with uh, Aboriginal representatives that were attending, but it just almost came down to this, that they want us to to talk about, okay, what do you want to see doing? But there wasn't a reconciliation attitude at that time. It it wasn't true. Um, it's just, no, well, let's just try and we'll bring people together and let them talk and let us hear them. But there's no real action. And and that's the same thing that is happening. But I think it's time for our Aboriginal people. And I remember being so frustrated and kind of disgusted with this whole thing. And then when you went to the conference, it was about missions and and there was nothing about Aboriginal people. And yet they had an umbrella of Aboriginal ministries. So there's a big disconnect between the churches. And so we're often seen as people that need help. Mm-hmm. But yet, we are a people that are resilient and strong. I think there's a move now that the Lord is pulling these people, pulling us out with a voice and knowing who we are in Him that are going to, you know, kind of shake things up and say, you know what, we're going to need to come together hand in hand. You need us and we need you. Yes, and it's an equal partnership, right? it's an right? equal partnership. It's not you coming over me and telling me what it is to be a Christian Mm -hmm. or what it is to be in ministry or what it is to be a missionary. Mm -hmm. It's taking um, the strengths that I have as an Indigenous Christian leader and taking your strengths and bringing them together. Yeah, exactly. You know, like when God called me out into this form of ministry, there was a lot of things that I had to learn from coming from what we're used to and our Indigenous kind of church and whatnot. I had to learn, you know, what it is to be a missionary, what it is to, what this vision is from this group of people, you know, what it is to do ministry. And sometimes, you know, I've come against this thing where it's like, it feels like 
the mission or the vision or uh, the ministry isn't aligning with each other, mm-hmm. but really it is because it's the work of the kingdom. Mm-hmm. You know, so we're doing the work of the kingdom. We're not doing the work of our own organizations, our own ministries, our own name. Yeah. You know, we're doing the work of the kingdom. Mm-hmm. We're re- going out there and we're reaching the lost. And, yeah. you know, we're we're bringing what we know to be true as Indigenous people is, you know, we know that brokenness. We know that hurt. We know that shame. We know we know what it is to be broken and we know what it is to be found. Mm-hmm. And I feel like um, when residential schools happened, that was the purpose of it was to kill our identity, mm-hmm. to kill who we were and to rob us of something, to rob us of, of that. Mm-hmm. But God is faithful. He is faithful and he is just. And he's building up this remnant of strong indigenous leaders Mm -hmm. and he's bringing them around the table, but not around the table for, you know, the other churches or the other denominations to have pity on, Mm -hmm. but to bring them into unity. Because for years, there's been indigenous churches around Manitoba, Alberta, you know, and so on in Canada. You know, I was was sitting around a a table a couple of weeks ago and, you know, my, my in-laws, Willard Gabosh has been a pastor and he started one of the first indigenous churches in Winnipeg Mm -hmm. over 30 years ago. I was part of his church. And you were part (laughs) of his church. And there's so many of us indigenous people that have come out of that church. And I sat around this table of women that love the Lord, truly love the Lord. They've been serving the Lord. They've been raised in church and they had no clue who this person was that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And you see the separation from, you know, the indigenous population to the capital C churches. Mm-hmm. And and I asked the Lord, I'm like, okay, well, there has to be a reconciliation among us first mm-hmm. before we can go out there and ask people to reconcile back to Christ or back to us or whatnot, right? We have to, as the body of Christ, be reconciled back to each other first. That would be the the example. The example of true reconciliation is when the body of Christ can be reconciled back to each other. But first, we have to be reconciled back to Christ. Exactly. And I think that's where my passion is. Now that I've went through this whole journey of just finding out and destroying out all of the religious stuff that kind of were intertwined. And so now I pop my head out and I'm not going back down. I'm not letting anyone push me down. <laughs> you're not going. You're not going back into the corner, right? Eh? No, you I'm can't not. Can't put baby in the corner. <laughs> no, no more. And 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 that's what's exciting. So, I I think we're just we're at the cusp of a great harvest. Yes. And yes. um and because that there's going to be a recon. Well, there it is. There's a reconciliation happening amongst the body of Christ. Yes. And we are much as part of it and an important component of it, but we're we're gonna be like one. And so there's this mobilization. I, I see this mobilization of people coming to aha, uh-huh, back to a relationship with God. Never mind a religion. Relationship, relationship and relationship with God, knowing who he is, how he he does things and and just seeing him in everything. Uh, co-laboring with him means that he he's the one doing the sailing. We're just coming alongside him. And he's guiding us. He's yeah, directing us, right? Yeah, we're his hands and um, and doing the work, and he, he gets all the glory for it. So we're being mobilized. So basically we're coming. We're coming together, and, I, I, and now we're just getting into this mobilization, and, and I think it's just going to speed up as, as more and more Indigenous people start finding their voice. Yes. Yes. You know, I feel like, you know, the enemy came to try to steal, kill, and destroy our voice. Mm-hmm. You know, but I feel like there is, you know, a group that are so connected to God that love Him, mm-hmm. that um, trust in Him, that built that relationship, that are going to be the forerunners of what real reconciliation is going to look like, mm-hmm. you know, because like we shared in the beginning, there's two different kind of views of reconciliation in this world, right? Mm-hmm. But first and foremost, you know, as Christians, as believers, and we have to be first reconciled back to Christ. And that's why he sent his son to die on the cross, that we would be reconciled back to him. Yeah. And and Jesus, his whole life is a template for us. Mm-hmm. And to, you know, get out into the streets, the highways and the byways, having dinner with the publicans. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And and getting into those spheres of influence wherever we are, and it's not just in the four walls. It's about uh, marketplace ministry. 
wherever the Lord puts you, then you start having an influence on policy, on even in the an environment and, you know, setting the stage for healthy workplaces. Healthy, healthy workplaces, healthy collaboration. Mm-hmm. Um, how would the indigenous population of church, of the body of Christ, and then the capital C or the white, or how would we suggest that we could come alongside each other and co-labor together with Christ in a way of unity and equal ship? Well, I think it comes to the point where as we had identify that we are, have strengths in Christ, right? We we have that power and authority that is given us. And we are to be bold and courageous. And yes. so we have to kick that old pattern of rejection and just, okay, we're rejected, never mind. Mm-hmm. And start uh, pushing forward and being fearless. And use our voices. And using our voices mm-hmm. and really call out uh, the racism for what it is, because there is racism in the body of Christ. Yes, it's pretty sadly, prevalent. but it, it's sad. But there is, yeah. But that's going to change because God is in control. Amen. Yeah, amen. <laughs> yes, I get excited Speak about that. that. Speak that. <laughs> that's going to change because God is in control. In what way would you coach someone, Indigenous or non-Indigenous, in your context that is interested in reconciliation but does not know how or where to begin? Well, I think we had another church that we kind of, the Lord kind of put us in together, but it kind of went on the wayside. Um, but I think it is, it's developing a relationship with each other. And relationship means that you, you sit down, you, you have supper with them, you start having a, a dialogue that's open and honest. And be in a safe place to say what you need to say without being offended. Because I think that's where it needs to be. And uh, we got to be people that are unoffendable when we're going after reconciliation. And to be those people, I feel like we need to be people that are healed, Mm -hmm. you know, that have gone through the healing. And the healing is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. No, it doesn't. You know, it's sometimes very dirty work, Mm -hmm. you know, to be healed, right? Like, because we have to dig and we have to go into those places and things have to be rooted up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it says it says in the words um, that we are to be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Yes. But it's also, when I talk about being unoffendable, we ourselves can't go into meetings to offend. Mm-hmm. So we have to do it out of love. We have to honor that person. They may not have it all together or, or may, they just don't understand how to even connect with us. And to understand that we may have triggers, but it's the same thing with them. And we also, whatever they're going through, love will cover a multitude of all sins. Yes. So that, uh, so even if they say things wrong, we, we out of love could correct them, but they can't get offended either. So it's both ways. And I think that's the coming around the table with this mindset of we both deserve to be here. We yeah. all deserve to be here. Yeah. We're not just asking you to the table. You have a seat at the table. Mm-hmm. You know, I was having a conversation with with someone a couple of weeks ago, and that was one of the things that I think I fear with this whole reconciliation thing is, you know, as uh, men and women of God, as the body of Christ, we're directed to show love. Mm-hmm. We're directed to, and that's our hearts, right? We carry the heart of the Father. Mm-hmm. So in all things, we we show love, we show kindness, we show, you know, respect and humility, right? Mm-hmm. And so when we're having these hard conversations and we're talking about healing and we're talking about rejection and we're talking about these things that were put in place to harm us and to kill us and to hurt us, when we're talking about these things, I think the people that are inviting us in to give us, you know, to give us that space also need to be respected. And, you know, be honored because they're, they are opening up, right? They mm-hmm. are opening up their, their space and inviting us in. So one of those things that I'm, I'm worried, I was worried about was people to go in, in that angry state still, mm-hmm. or yeah. in, in that trauma state still and be like, it is my time now. It is my time to say what I want, you know, and you not, have to listen yeah, and you have to listen, you yeah. know, and, and, and just go on this whole rant. Yes. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I work as a missionary in, in the inner city and, 
I have met some awesome, awesome people that serve the kingdom of God and love people. And their heart is to see reconciliation and their heart is to see indigenous leaders rise up. But sometimes um, there are other people that don't carry that heart, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's just, there's all different categories of people and all different places of healing, all different places of the journey that they're on. And I just don't want us to keep hurting one another, Mm -hmm. you know, to keep hurting one, one another in the lack of knowledge or the lack of identity or the lack of reconciliation, true reconciliation to the Father. And so that's one of my hopes is that, you know, when these doors start to open up and these conversations start to happen, and one of my hopes with Journey with Care is to give dialogue, you know, to these conversations and to give a space where we can have them and um, have true, honest conversations. And to have true, honest conversations are not going to be easy, right? Mm -hmm. So, but if we all come in with this humility and the love of God, those offenses, you know, won't stand a chance to what God really wants to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have to tear those walls down of offenses. And when when there's an an offensive spirit, it really prevents people from actually hearing from God. So we need to tear those walls down of offense and forgive. And we just have to forgive. And then from there, through the love of God, start working together. How would you say that we can start doing that, tearing those walls down. How would we do that? Well, we need to be delivered. (laughs) (laughs) We have to be delivered, set free, and sanctified. (laughs) Exactly. And so, and and be healed Healed, and be made whole. And yes, it is a process, but as painful as it is, sometimes you just have to get down to the roots and pull those roots out. And that's where the true freedom is. And there's just such joy in being free of all those roots and yeah. um, insecurity of always seeing rejection everywhere. There's, it's a such freedom in this. It's actually less stress-free. <laughs> what would it look like to journey with care in this context, in your context? Well, well, when we are made whole, we, we naturally tend to want to care for others. And so if we see an injustice, then we'll step forward and and do something about it and be that voice, be that advocate. And right now, we just have to get in alignment with God and His will yes. for our lives. And He's all He's given us a vision. He's given each one of us a destiny, and He has a work for each one of us. We have to align with Him first. And it, it all comes down to that. And, you know, every, every story is going to be different, but that's the beauty of it. Yes, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Um, what is one thing you wish non-Indigenous Christians would understand about your story? I think I think people have to understand that if they see an angry person, an Indigenous person that comes in angry, then just understand that they were been triggered. There's a trigger there. And it all comes down to, and for me as an Indigenous woman, um, colonization kind of really took the role of the woman away. There was an important role of indigenous women to, um, th- they were the people that made the decisions. Mm-hmm. And they were just as much part of the leadership and they were honored and for their voice. So this is just a natural progression of the Lord kind of putting us back into that because he he loved us yeah speaking about being triggered you know when i first um joined the missionary field about three years ago i was called into a position to be a community minister and i came in broken i came in you know in with places that you know god still wanted to root up and to heal and so you know these people surrounded me and loved me and cared for me and and wanted to encourage me and build me up to be what god has has wanted me to be um, but there was there was, there was these times where I would get triggered, and um, things would would happen. And and you know, this one time I remember one of my superiors over me had messaged me and was like, um, "Melvina, maybe you shouldn't be you know having one on ones in your car." This and this and that. And and this person saw it on my Facebook, right? So I I immediately uh, messaged back and was like, "I don't appreciate my Facebook being used to reprimand me." You know, mm-hmm. my personal Facebook used to reprimand me. And he replied back to me. He said, I'm not trying to reprimand you. I'm trying to care for you and make sure that we're 
able to continue doing ministry, you know, the way that God is asking us to do ministry so you don't get in trouble, basically. He was trying to care for me that I don't get in trouble. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see it that way. And I had to stop and I, and you know, I immediately just, I, tr I was triggered. Mm -hmm. And then so I just reacted in that offense. And I had to ask the Lord, like, okay, well, why did I get offended like that? Why did that come out of me like that? And then so he took me on a journey where um, when I was younger, everything I did was wrong. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, and, and that's what with the residential school, it's all come down to we were never trained. Yes. And our the residential school survivors were never trained. They were hit. They were screamed at. They were. And so until they got it right. Mm -hmm. So it just passed on. And so I think with reconciliation, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of training. A lot of training, yes. But also a lot of, and I, I really, really respect where I was at that time and the leadership that I was under, was that they were able to see that. Mm -hmm. And they were able to come alongside me. That even though I lashed out, mm -hmm. they were able to show me grace. Because that's what God is. God is grace. Right? Well, yeah. And unconditional love. Unconditional so love. These yeah. people were sent to, to you in that time to, to learn. teach me. Yeah. And to help me through that process of like figuring out what those triggers are mm -hmm. and what are those roots, right? And so I, I truly believe that the church, the body of Christ, have such power. We hold such influence to come alongside each other with that same grace that God has shown us and to extend that, mm -hmm. to extend that to others. And walk alongside them in that healing, because reconciliation isn't going to be easy. No, it's not. And uh, but it's it's vital, and uh, there's just no way around it. <laughs> yeah, there's no way around it. You know. Yeah, I really appreciated um, the leader that was over me that time, and and really got me to search my heart. And it's training our minds, right? Because our minds were programmed to think a certain way, especially mm -hmm. when when we deal with rejection or abandonment. Mm -hmm. um, our minds see things negatively. They see, you know, I used to see the, the cup, you know, the glass that's sitting in front of you as half empty. Mm -hmm. You know, I, that's how I used to see it. Now I see it as it's half full. You know, you got a lot of water there. <laughs> yeah. And I, I just remember, I'll just share this one story about my journey, one of my little journeys. I worked for this particular lady. Her name is Tracy. Uh, for about all my nursing career. And I remember the first time I met her, she hugged me. And I never got hugged before. Like, And you're like, why are you touching why me? Why are you touching yeah. me? Yeah. Like I was stiff as a board and she just laughed it off. You know, every time I saw her. And then so we would attend these meetings and I was a, a young nurse um, just starting out my career. And she was our my tribal nursing officer. And we would go to meetings. So we'd have to come all into meetings with all these other nurses from other communities in our area. And um come into the city of Winnipeg and meet together. And I would try and figure out ways to get away from her, but she would come find me. <laughs> and it was just like... You'd avoid her, I, avoid her, try to go this way. Oh, and yeah. She, yeah. Or leave a little early, but she'll find me in the bathroom. She'll come chasing me down the hall. And I thought, you know what? And I, I told her, I said, you know, you wore me down. <laughs> so if you, everybody knows me now, I like hugging. I, I just hug people. But you see, that's the kind of love is she knew that I needed that. And she's just a loving person. So, and yet she's not a child of God, but the Lord still used her. So now I'm, I'm probably going to be that person running up. Like people try and run out the door and I'll say, come here, come here. <laughs> like, you know, with my hands. Because okay, yeah, we all need love. Right? Yeah, we all need love. We all need that affection. And I think that's what we all are, you know, we all desire. We all striving for it, is that, is that love and acceptance. And, you know, that we're, you know, we're not just, here on earth, but mm -hmm. there's a purpose and there's a, you know, there's someone out there that wants to hug us and chase us down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, and I, I just love it. So basically just, just love us the way the Lord would love us. And um, whatever our reaction and whatever, whenever we're triggered, just love us anyway. And that's what be, my message would be. Um, well, well, thank you for that one. But what word of encouragement would you like to share with other Indigenous listeners? Well, I believe um, my words of encouragement is really get in relationship with God. Don't allow fear um, because our, I guess our current, you know, with our past traumas and intergenerational trauma, 
it it made us fear God and um, that he was this person that was going to, like, whatever we do, or you, you can go near him. But to be reconciled with him is he loves us. He wants, whenever we're going through a rough time, just jump in his lap. Let him allow him to comfort you, sing to you, sing you a lullaby. Let him stroke your hair. Let him let him tell tell you that everything is going to be okay because he's, you know, it, that's just so comforting. But that's that intimate relationship that we're talking about. Get to know him the way Jesus knew him. And he, he came to earth to reveal the Father. And see, Jesus did whatever the, uh, the Lord told him to. And he also had that character of God for the people. My encouragement is, you know, just jump in Father's lap. Don't be afraid to just get in connection with him. And that's where everything will originate. If you do that, everything else will fall into place for you. It reminds me of in Second Corinthians, Paul tells the church that in our weakness, he's made strong. Mm-hmm. You know, and that just gives me reassurance that I can be weak, that I can I can fail, and I cannot have it all together. And I, you know, I'm a, I'm a work in progress, right? Right? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm I'm striving for perfection. You know, it's to be more like Jesus every day mm-hmm. when I wake up. That even in my weakness and even in my mistakes, I can come to him as I am. And that's when his strength will be revealed. So like you said, you can just jump in his lap and just, you know, tell him everything. Because he knows us, right? He yeah. knows the, the hairs on our head. He knows the thoughts that we think before we think them. He knows our hurts. He knows the things that we hide from the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. He knows those things already. And he just wants us to trust him with them yeah, and to go with him and just to sit on his lap and just to tell him, this is what I'm struggling with. This is what I'm battling with. This is the insecurity that I have. This is how I'm feeling. This is, you know, and, and once we do that in our weakness, when we're able to be weak to him and we're able to come to him in that weakness, that's when his strength will be. Re- exactly. And when his strength is revealed, you just get, you just get up knowing, oh, hey, Jesus got my back. Yeah, he he has me. He yeah, has me. He's and holding you, my hand. And when you know that, man, you can walk in that boldness. You can walk in that calling, in that authority, in that God-given right as sons and daughters. And and just go ahead and love those that hurt us, and then mm-hmm. we could pray for them, and you know, just pray that they would be come into that revelation of who He is and who they are in Him, and just know that they are loved too. Yeah. Yeah. So as as a people of God, we we have to work together. And it got so lonely. And that's one of my my uh, visions is to set up a network I've already talked about. Yes. And uh, putting that together and this learning to support one another. I think that's totally lost. You know, learning how to just come to that place where you could talk to somebody about the struggles and get encouragement, you know, mm-hmm. and pray together and and teach and, you know, just support one another, those that are in the front lines. Yes. Well, I encourage you in that to to work towards that. Um, you shared that vision with me a, a while back. And I think that we need that as women. We need that as women in ministry. Uh, we need that that friendship and that sisterhood and, and, and being able to come alongside each other and support each other and encourage each other. Mm-hmm. You know, so I bless you in that. I know that once you put your hands to it, it's going to prosper because that's the word of God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so I thank you, uh, Melissa Spence. She is uh, the co-pastor of Blessings Church on, what's the address? 621 College Avenue in Winnipeg. 621 College Avenue in Winnipeg. Um, her and her husband, Warren Spence, lead the church there. It's a beautiful church. I would suggest to stop by for, you know, um, some fellowship with them. They are very welcoming, loving people. They love the community and they love their church and and the church family. I just want to thank our listeners for listening to Journey with Care with Melvina Gabosh. Until the next time. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Journey with Care podcast, where paths connect over real life stories and honest conversations. We hope you continue to join us on this journey of faith, reconciliation and loving our neighbor. Be sure to like, follow and share. Special thanks to host Melvina Gabosh, ARC podcast engineer Johan Heinrichs and donors who help make this show possible. Journey with Care is an initiative of Care Impact, 
a Canadian charity dedicated to connecting and equipping the whole church across Canada to effectively journey in community with children and families in hard places. Learn how Care Impact is transforming the way churches engage with child welfare with our Care Portal technology and academy training. To support this podcast or to learn more about us, go to careimpact.ca or click the link in the show notes. We're so glad you are part of this journey with us as we journey with care, even in the messy. Until next time.